Okay gang, we're gonna switch gears and head over to mean land or numerical variable land, however you wanna think about it, but we're gonna run single sample t-tests for means. All right, so we're gonna have that, that null hypothesis, right, where you have h sub zero, you got mu equaling some number here. Um, and then the alternate, again, you're gonna either have a greater than, a less than, or a not equals to. And just like it's been so far, this is a right-tailed test, a left-tailed test, and a two-tailed test, or we could call these guys, these are one-sided tests. And we call this a two-sided test. So again, we can either talk about how many sides they're dealing with or what tails, so right, left, two. Or we could call these, again, collectively, these are the one-sided tests. These are the two-sided tests. And it's two-sided because not equals to includes the greater than alternate and the less than alternate, it includes both of them. Um, and the two-sided tests are equivalent to confidence intervals. meaning that we get the same information or we would draw the same conclusion from running, running a two-sided test as running or calculating a confidence interval. The relationship has to be that whatever your alpha level is for your hypothesis test, that has to be complementary to the confidence level. So what I mean by that is if you were running alpha being 10%, that would be equivalent to a 90% confidence interval. So you just have to make sure that your alpha and your confidence level add up to 100%, or you could say they're complementary, and then you're good to go. All right, our test statistic, we're gonna leave the z-scores behind, and we're gonna be back on the t-distribution, just like we were in chapter eight for means. You've got your value minus your mean over your standard error. So you've got your sample mean minus your population mean over your standard error. Stat minus parameter over standard deviation. And again, we're on the sampling distribution for means. Um, P-value, it's going to be area into the curve, and we're going to go back to degrees of freedom being n minus 1. So if we want the P-value for a right-tailed test, we're going to find the area under the T distribution to the right of the calculated T test statistic. If we have the left-sided test, we'll go to the left of the calculated test statistic. And just like in proportion land, when we have the two-sided tests, that's when things get fun. If your number from step 10 is positive, you're going to go to the right of that number and double it for symmetry. If the value you find in step 10 is negative, if your test statistic is negative, go to the left of that number and double it for symmetry. All right. In terms of assumptions, they're very familiar. They're the same assumptions that we dealt with in chapter, what were we on, 8? Yeah, I can do it. Um, so we still want a random sample or that our sample represents our population, uh, we would like, well not we would like, we need normality. That is the deal breaker assumption. So just like confidence intervals, either the population distribution is stated to be normal, or the sample size is large enough for the central limit theorem to kick in, or we make some kind of graph of your data that shows plausible normality. You can make a histogram, a dot plot, uh, a box plot, a normal probability plot, a stem and leaf plot. I typically make box plots, but you're welcome to make any of those. And again, this is the deal breaker assumption. If this is not met, we're going to have to stop the problem. The third assumption is knowing that sample standard deviation. Right? And again, like we had with chapter 8 and the confidence intervals, if, forever, if there's ever a case where you know sigma, Right? If you know the population standard deviation, if you do, then you could run a z-test. All right, so you're more than allowed, let me write the word run a little better, to run a z-test if you know the, the population standard deviation. It's just that in the real world, we don't ever know the population standard deviation it, and we use the sample standard deviation as its replacement. And when you, you're a little less accurate, meaning you have a little less information about your population, when we only have S, we use a T distribution because the Ts have a little bit more variability, give us slightly larger P values. We're a little bit less likely to reject the null because the null is the status quo. 
So if you have sigma, go ahead and run the z-test. And then there are stats folks that believe once the sample size is 30 or higher, they don't care that you don't know sigma, they'll run the z-test anyways. So I just want you to hear that's out there and you're gonna see that option on your calculator. We're never gonna run a z-test in here. We're only ever gonna run that t-test. So again, I would say run a z-test, but this is only in another class. For your class, you're always gonna run the t-test. Here's how you make your decision. Right? Same as last time, if your p-value is less than alpha, reject the null and you have sufficient evidence for the alternate. If your p-value is greater than alpha, you're gonna to fail to reject the null and you do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate. And I didn't point this out a whole bunch um, when we were going through those first two examples in proportion land, but I want you to just take a look at the similarities in these write-ups. Right? When your p-value is less than alpha, you reject h naught. Well, if it's greater than, you only add two more words to your write-up, and right? you just add fail to. So these first sentences are pretty similar, uh, with the exception of you got two extra words here. And if you look here, right, the second sentence, you have sufficient evidence for the alternate. Well, I just have two extra words again, right? Here it is, you do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate. So both of these write-ups are pretty similar. They just have a couple of extra words when you're failing to reject the null. Uh, we're going to draw a picture, just like we did last time. This time we're going to be on the T distribution, not the Z distribution. So we're on all of those those graphs that look like the Z-curve, but they have slightly higher tails and their peaks are a little lower. And if you remember from last time, <coughs> excuse me, as the degrees of freedom increase, the tails get closer and closer to the, that Z-curve and the peak gets higher and higher to that, or raises up to that, that peak of the Z-curve. If you have a left tail test or a less than test, you're gonna shade the area to the left of your test statistic. If you have a right-tailed alternate or a greater than alternate, you're going to shade the area to the right of your test statistic. And when you have that two-sided test, right, when you have mu does not equal a number for your alternate, right, that's including mu is greater than that number or mu is less than that number, right? That's why we have that two-sided test. So you get that you have these two tails, right? We're calling it that two-tailed test. Well, if your test statistic is negative, let's say you crunched to step 10 and you got a negative number, shade the area to the left, find that area under that curve, and then you can double it because this area to the right side, or excuse me, on the right tail is the same as the area on the left tail. That's why I keep saying double it for symmetry. But if you crunch your number in step 10 and it pops out the positive test statistic, that's fine. Then find the area to the right of that test statistic and double it for symmetry, okay? And then this is that same blurb that we had in chapter eight. So as n gets larger, the shape of the t distribution gets closer to the shape of the z distribution, right? It gets closer to the standard normal curve, right? Tails come down, peaks go up. The larger your sample, the more robust your inference procedure. Now, when I talk about inference procedures, we're talking about confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. Okay, so the larger your sample, the more robust your hypothesis test and confidence intervals, the more likely skewness will not affect your plausible normality. For smaller samples, we need our graphs to be roughly symmetric with no outliers. As n gets larger, we allow some wiggle room for skewness, and as n approaches 30, we know the sampling distribution for means approaches normality. And many statisticians will actually use the standard normal distribution when the sample is larger than 30. Again, I won't, but I do want you to hear that some folks out there do. All right, so I'm gonna flip the page. We're gonna review those 13 steps and just do a quick recap of what we've talked about with hypothesis testing, and then we'll get into it with the, the mean hypothesis tests. I'll see you in a bit, bye. Okay, so here are our 13 steps again. Uh, we, we've gone over these in proportion land. We're gonna do them again with a couple more free response questions in examples nine and 10 in a moment. We'll do them in mean land. But here were our steps, and I'm gonna to wanna to see all 13 of these steps on your free response questions. So in step one, make sure you define the parameter about which hypotheses are to be tested. So you're gonna define a P if you're in proportion land or a mu if you're in mean land. Whatever letter you define up here, again, I'll, I'll put here for parameter, I want either mu or P, yeah, depending on the land, use this letter in your null and your alternate. Right, put colons after null and alternate. You have an equal sign in the null, either a greater than, a less than, or a not equals to in the alternate. 
It should have the same symbol in both and the same number in both. Okay. State your significance level or your alpha level, all right, or your level of significance. But again, the default, the industry standard is 0.05. Okay. Check your assumptions. All right. You have different assumptions in mean land and proportion land. Use the appropriate assumptions. State the distribution that you're going to use. And in, in chapter nine, you're either gonna be on the Z distribution if you're in proportion land, or you're gonna be on the T distribution if you're in mean land. And actually, just so I stay consistent, let me write P or mu up here so that we're talking about proportion land first and mean land second. So if you're in proportion land, you're on the Z distribution. If you're in mean land, you're on the T distribution. State the name of the test, right? So you're always gonna tell me the number of samples all right, which land you're in. Let me put dashes on these. And which letter you're using. So for chapter nine, it's always one sample. You'll either be in mean land or proportion land, and you'll either use a Z or a T. All right, degrees of freedom. It's applicable in mean land, right? It's n minus one, that's the formula in mean land. There are no degrees of freedom in proportion land. The z-scores never have degrees of freedom. All right, display the test statistic to be used at this point without any computation. Well, we talked about the test statistic for proportion land, and, and we referenced it here. The, the test statistic in mean land is this, this formula. This is quite literally, this is step nine, as is. Step 10 will be you plugging in your numbers for your particular problem. So tell me, what was your sample mean? What was your hypothesized mean? What was your sample standard deviation? What was your sample size? All right, so I'll want all of those plugged in for step 10, and then we'll crunch a number together. All right, for 11, you're gonna get me the p-value, and this is a pretty important one because the p-value is gonna help us decide if we reject or fail to reject the null. So a p-value is a probability, so this should be a number between, oops, that's not how you write between, but a number between zero and one. Okay. I'm gonna show you how to calculate a p-value when you're in mean land. We're not going to use normal CDF because we're not gonna be on the normal distribution. We're gonna be on the t-distribution. All right, we're gonna sketch a picture of the situation. When it comes to sketching pictures, you owe me one of these three graphs, right? You either had a left-tailed test, a right-tailed test, or a two-tailed test. And we're gonna shade appropriately. And then for 13, it's your conclusion, right? It's the big finish, you owe me two sentences. You gotta first tell me if you're gonna reject or fail to reject the null. And then you gotta tell me if you have evidence or don't for the alternate. And we mentioned on the previous page, these write-ups are pretty darn similar, right? If your p-value is less than alpha, reject H0, and then say, tell me I have sufficient evidence for the alternate. And instead of the alternate, make sure you use context, right? But if it's greater than alpha, tack on the words fail to in that first sentence, and tack on the words do not in that second sentence. So those write-ups are going to be pretty similar regardless of which direction you go. All right. I want to introduce an, uh, a vocab or a, a, an expression in stats called statistically significant. So you're going to hear me talk about this. Let me scoot this up so we can all see basically some summaries on null hypotheses, or I'm sorry, on hypotheses testing. All right. So there we go. Oops. All right. So when you hear statisticians say test results are statistically significant, Right, statistically significant, meaning the results are important. We want to pay attention to them. They are significant. They're going to change the status quo. They're going to change our minds from what we normally or we assume to be true. So statisticians say test results are statistically significant if the null is rejected, i.e. there's a low probability that an observed effect would have occurred due to chance. And, and I'm going to unpack p-value in a little bit, all right? We're, we're gonna unpack p-value towards the end of this chapter. I'm getting there. I know p-value's still a little bit vague. We're working on how to calculate the number, but I will circle back around to what it means. All right, so statistically significant means the results that you see are unlikely due to chance, right? It's probably not chance that this, this is happening. It probably means the null is incorrect and it's time to reject it. So the p-value is the probability of obtaining the difference you saw 
the difference from the sample and the parameter if there really isn't a difference, all right? So when you have your null mean or your null proportion and you compare it with your sample mean or sample proportion, there's gonna be a difference between the two numbers, all right? It might be a big difference, it might be a small difference, but the p-value is, is a way of, of articulating or putting a, a number to um, the probability that that difference that you saw between your statistic and your parameter, what's the probability that that was due to chance? All right, pending there wasn't really a difference, okay? All right, a conventional and arbitrary threshold for declaring statistical significance is a p-value less than 0.05. So we told you the industry standard is about 5%. All right, so we'll reject the null if your p-value is less than 5%. And again, when you reject the null, we say things are statistically significant. All right, statistical significance doesn't always mean practical significance. Only by considering context can we determine whether a difference is practically significant, that is, whether it requires action. Um, I'll give you one that I saw. Um, a while ago, I was an SAT tutor, so I saw that um, if you took this certain SAT prep course, uh, all right, it boasted that you're, you're the, if you take this course and you're going to do statistically significantly better on the SATs if you take this prep course. So I, I'm going to, I don't remember what the SAT prep course was called. I don't think it was Kumon. It was something else. So this SAT prep course bragged, right, statistically higher results. if you take our course. All right, so that was what I saw on their, on their brag sheet. Like, hey, take, take our prep course. You're gonna do statistically better. Like, you're definitely gonna do better. It's significantly better. And they were correct. It was statistically significant, but it wound up not being practically significant. So when I asked for the results, um, if you took that prep course, you scored on average about five points better than somebody who didn't take that prep course. And if, if you know anything about the SATs, scoring five points better, it's not like you're going to all of a sudden get into Harvard or something. You're like, oh, I was really close to getting into Harvard. I just missed it by five points on my SAT. So while it was statistically significant, while they actually could say this sentence on their, on their brag sheet, it didn't practically mean anything. All right, I, I wasn't going to go drop $1,000 so that I could score five points higher. It wasn't practically significant. So we can have plenty of things be statistically significant, but then we as humans need to tack on, okay, is this practically significant, all right? I've talked about how two-sided tests are equivalent to confidence intervals, and I personally prefer confidence intervals. I'll run a confidence interval any day before I run a hypothesis test. And confidence intervals also indicate statistical significance if the interval does not contain your hypothesized parameter. All right, so if whatever your null parameter is, all right, let's say it was mu equaling 82. If 82 isn't in your confidence interval, then you know you have statistical significance. We actually saw that with the fisherman example, right? We had that our null proportion was that 80% of the lake bass was um, allegedly, uh, they met that minimum length requirement. And we went, when we ran that confidence interval, we saw that 80% wasn't in that confidence interval which was another way of rejecting the null, which meant our, our findings were statistically significant, okay? All right, with large sample sizes, you're virtually certain to see statistically significant results. And that's because when your N is really high, your standard error is gonna be really low, and it's easy to trip up a small p-value at that point. So again, with large sample sizes, you're virtually certain to see, see statistically significant results. In such situations, it's important to interpret the size of the difference for potential practical significance. So again, just because something is numerically significant doesn't mean it's practically significant. Small sample sizes often do not yield statistical significance. When they do, the differences themselves tend to also be practically significant. That is, they're meaningful enough to warrant action. So especially with small sample sizes, if we trip up a small p-value, it is probably time to reject the p-value and change your way of thinking, right? And that's what it means by statistically significant. It's significant enough for us to change our minds, change away from the status quo, because the null hypothesis always has the status quo going on. All right, so with that, we're gonna take a look at an example in Meanland. 
Uh, yeah, and we're, we're going to do a hypothesis test in Meanland. I'll see you in a bit. Bye. All right, gang, let's start to do this. We're going to read through this. I want you to be on the listen for always, what is the variable? Or what are clues that we are in mean land or proportion land? All right, so here we go. One concern employers have about the use of technology is the amount of time that employees spend each day making personal use of company technology, such as personal phone calls, non-business related email, internet use, and computer games. The AP, that's the Associated Press, reported that a management consultant believes that on average, workers spend 75 minutes a day making personal use of company technology. Suppose that the CEO of a large corporation wants to determine whether the average amount of time spent on personal use of company technology for her employees is greater than the reported value of 75 minutes. Each person in a random sample of employees was contacted and asked about daily personal use of company technology. The resulting data are as follows, and I can see some data here. Do these data provide evidence that the mean for this company is greater than 75 minutes? Carry out a hypothesis test with a 5% alpha level. Whew, okay. So let's see if we can figure this out. So words that I kind of um, glommed onto here, I, I see the word mean, okay? That's a great one. Um, I saw up here the word average. That was another great one. Uh, another thing that caught my, my interest is this, minutes, right? I saw some units in this problem. So those three things are indicating to me that I'm in mean land. And also, if you think about this random sample of 10 employees, what were we asking them? What was the variable in this problem, right? I asked them about their daily use of, uh, or excuse me, daily personal use of company tech. And you can see this is numerical data, right? 66 minutes, 70 minutes, 75 minutes. It's a numerical variable. And we're gonna look at averages when we're dealing with numerical variables. All right, and, and you can take a step back. How often do you use um, personal or do make personal use of company technology? I'd be lying if I said I didn't. There's plenty of times when I'm in my office and I'm looking up Star Wars toys I wanna buy. So it happens to the best of us. And it looks like the average is, oh my goodness, 75 minutes a day. So I'm well under that. Uh, but but I, I do make personal use of company tech. I think all of us do. Or I won't say all of us, enough of us. All right, so I'm going to make some notes to myself. I see that I'm in mean land. All right. I also saw this word, evidence. As soon as I see evidence, I know I'm going to write a hypothesis test. And on top of that, they just straight out told me, carry out a hypothesis test. Okay, no problem. If I'm gonna run a hypothesis test, I know I'm gonna be doing a t-test, all right? In mean land, you're always on the t-distribution. And in terms of the number of samples, yes, my sample size was one. Excuse me, my sample size was 10, my bad. There were 10 employees, but I only ran this survey once. So I didn't run this survey one day, come back and ask, uh, a different set of 10 people the next day. I didn't ask two different companies. This is just one sample. All right, so we've got one sample here. All right, so with all of that, it's time for me to go run that hypothesis test. So let's take a look at our 13 steps and start writing up our stats proof. So the first thing I have to do is define a parameter. It's either gonna be a P or a mu. I'm gonna choose mu this time because I'm in mean land. So what is our average, our true average? What, I'm gonna start scooting this up so that I have some space to write these steps out. So step one, if I do this, is gonna mu, mu is gonna be equal to the true average. And let's think about what I'm keeping track of, right? I'm not talking about number of friends people have, number of pets people have. This is the true average daily time spent on personal use of com company technology, right? So true average daily personal use of company technology. True average daily personal use of company technology. And just so we're clear, the units on this are minutes. All right, so 66 minutes, 70 minutes, 75 minutes, so on and so forth. All right, let's see what we got next. The next two steps kind of come together, right? We got ho and ha, so I need my null and I need my alternate. Okay, 
So I'm going to write steps two and three down. All right, so whatever parameter you defined in step one should show up in step two. So if I defined a mu here, I should see mu in the null and the alternate. And I know I'm going to have an equal sign here. And then we got to figure out what was the claim? What are we assuming is true? So if I scooch this back down, let's see if we can identify the parameter, the claim about people's personal use of company technology. So it looks like the claim is 75 minutes. I see that shown up here and here, right? That's the status quo. That's what we can assume is true for everybody. And this CEO just wants to say, hey, is it greater than 75 minutes? So we're gonna assume her employees spend about 75 minutes a day on personal use of company tech. And she's suspicious, is it greater than 75 minutes? And in terms of where I'm getting the, the alternate, I mean, it straight up says greater than right in here. Okay. Now it might be a little um, subtle. This is my population mean, but I was actually given a sample mean. I don't know if you see it because you have the raw data, but I can find out what the sample mean is. So let's put our data in our list. I already did. I just want to give you some gut feelings here. So if I take a look at my data, it's in L1. If I want run one of our stats off of L1, all right, let's look at my average. I just want us to take note here that X bar, my sample mean, was 74.8 minutes. And I mention this because it's, it's not obvious that you were given a statistic, but you were, all right? The statistic is hidden in the raw data, but I can get a, st a summary stat on it, 74.8. All right, so just looking at that, which one do you think is true? Do you think ho is true or do you think ha is true? And if I'm looking at it, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards ho, right? The null, because to me, it seems very possible but that if the true average was really 75 minutes a day, that it's possible just from chance that these 10 people had an average of 74.8. I think this difference between 75 and 74.8 could very likely be due to chance. That doesn't seem like a big discrepancy and it really doesn't seem like mu is greater than 75. That doesn't seem like evidence for the alternate. I'm gonna get a p-value associated with that, but it never hurts to get some gut feelings right out the gate. Okay, let's see what step four is. So if we look at step four, I go find my significance level. I'm gonna to default to 0.05 if I wasn't given one. And so that I'm not flipping back and forth between pages, the next thing I gotta do is check my assumptions. All right, so let's see, was I given an alpha? I was. So I will say that my alpha level is the industry standard of 5%. Okay, great. Let's go get some assumptions. And let me scoot the paper up so that I have room to get all of those assumptions in there. Okay. Now, when we were doing the stuff in proportion land, I didn't really hone in on, on your, um, your trait table that we, I gave you, but I do want to point it out now. So we used this back when we were in confidence intervals, but I have, uh, and if you look on the second page of this, it extends to chapter nine, right? You can see we have the one sample hypothesis tests for whether you're in mean land or proportion land. Now we're in mean land, if you see here, right? We've got these two options. You're either in mean land or you're in proportion land. We're in mean land. And so I wanna go through the assumptions here. All right, so I want us to start getting in the habit of using this trait table to help us through our problems. So did I have a random sample or did my sample represent my population? Well, let's see what we had here. So if I look through the phrasing, I see random sample. So let me go ahead and take note of that, that I did have a random sample. Okay. The next thing we wanna check for is normality. So let's see how we can assess normality in mean land. So the way to get normality in mean land is either that my population distribution was given as normal. All right, let's see. Was there the word normal written anywhere in here? And as we breeze through this, normality was not stated in the problem. Okay, if not stated, which it wasn't, use this central limit theorem as long as the sample size is 30 or higher. 
Well, let's go back. What was our sample size? Our sample size, unfortunately, was just 10, so it wasn't large enough to get the central limit theorem to kick in. It says, or make a plot of the data for plausible normality, i.e. relatively little skewness and no outliers. Okay, well, I've got my data in L1. I can make a, a graph. So let me get my calculator back up. And let's see what we got going on here. If I go into my plots, just looks like I left plot one on, L1 against one, that's great. Let me just hit zoom nine. And I've got a distribution that's skewed right, right? I mean, you can see the right half, the right tail is much longer than the left tail, but it's fine, right? It's still, we're actually gonna say it's good enough. We're allowed to be pretty liberal with how skewed data can get, because again, this is only 10 data points. So it's still plausible that these 10 data points came from a normally distributed population. All right, so my sample of 10 might have come from a normally distributed population. I don't have any outliers, so I'm not gonna stop the problem. I only stop the problem when outliers are present. That's when it's really unclear that you can get on the T distribution. So I'm just gonna sketch this a little bit. All right, I think it looks something like this. All right, let me get that. So I'm gonna say my box plot was skewed right, but there were no outliers. Okay. So again, I'm only really gonna stop the problem when I have some outliers. All right, let's take a look at that third assumption and see what we got. So if I'm in mean land, and which I am, it says the value of the sample standard deviation is given. You may need technology to calculate this value. Well, I do need technology to calculate it. I wasn't given the sample standard deviation. It didn't flat out give it to me, which is fine. Um, but if you can see here from one of our stats, there's the sample standard deviation, right? 9.45. And what would the units on this be? Well, it would be minutes, right? Our, our data is in minutes, so all of our statistics will have the same units as our problem. So this is 9.45 minutes. Okay, so through my assumptions, let's take a look at the next step in a hypothesis test, all right? So step six, all right, we have to state which distribution we're on. We're gonna use the T distribution because we're in mainland. All right, step seven is gonna to be to state the name of the test. So again, number of samples, which land are you in, which letter are you using? So I had one sample, I'm in mainland, and I'm gonna use a T distribution. So one sample mean T hypothesis test. So let's keep that in mind, T distribution for step six, one sample mean T hypothesis test for step seven, and then we gotta get the degrees of freedom. Okay, so I'm gonna flip back and write those steps down. So step six, I'm on the T distribution. All right, step seven, we're gonna do a one sample mean T hypothesis test. Step eight, is your degrees of freedom, all right? And the degrees of freedom formula in mean land is just sample size minus one. Right? It's always, I'll write it down here, but I'm gonna erase it to fill in my number. It's n minus one. Our n, our sample size was 10, so we had nine degrees of freedom. Okay, and some people actually put this superscript or subscript here, they'll write t sub nine because they're specifying it's the T-curve when you have nine degrees of freedom. Because for every different degree of freedom, your T-curve changes slightly. Okay, so step nine, right? Display the test statistic as a formula without any computation. And then step 10 is going to be to plug in your numbers to your specific problem. So let's take a moment, go back two pages and find step nine. So there's step nine as is, x bar minus mu over a standard error, right? S over square root n. So let me write that down. And let me make sure we can see, I'm gonna scooch this up again. All right, I think that's looking semi-decent. So we'll go step nine. 
we've got t equaling x bar minus mu s over square root n down here. Okay, so we knew our x bar, we got it from one of our stats, it was 74.8. My mean was 75. My standard deviation was, what was it, 9.45. And my sample size was 10. So we've got all of that, right? I'm plugging in my numbers for my particular problem. And when you do that, that's actually step 10 happening. So nine is the formula in general. Step 10 is with your numbers plugged in. And you're gonna trust me again. We're gonna take this leap of faith and I'm gonna just tell you it's negative 0.07, okay? Now, I wanna kind of combo steps 11 and 12 and actually go in the wrong order just to show you a point, all right? Just to drive this point home. So we're gonna, oh, I just realized I wrote number between and I never wrote anything after it. They should say number between zero and one, all right. Sorry, so step 11 is calculate the p-value and step 12 is sketch a picture. So I'm gonna go in the opposite order because I want you to see what the, the graph looks like and then that'll inform our guess of the p-value, okay? So with that, let me find my ruler, got it. All right, so I'm gonna do step 12 over here and then I'm gonna come back around and do step 11. All right, so if I was gonna draw a graph of this situation, you are on the t distribution, all right? You are not on the standard normal curve. So we are gonna make a bell curve, something that looks like a bell curve. It's gonna have higher tails and a slightly lower peak, that's fine. Looks something like this, it's good enough, okay? And instead of labeling this as a z-axis, it is a t-axis because we are on the t distribution. Zero is still under the peak, all right? But how this works is whatever number you get in step 10, graph it in step 12. So negative 0.07 would be somewhere around here, okay? So let's do negative 0.07, okay. Now I wanna figure out, should I shade to the right or should I shade to the left? So here's how this works. It depends on your alternate. Now we had a greater than alternate. We had a one-sided test. So what you wanna shade is the area under the t distribution to the right of the calculated t. We have a right-tailed test, so let's shade to the right. As you can see from here, that's a pretty good chunk of your curve you're shading, right? This isn't 10% of the curve, it's not 20%, it's actually greater than 50% because it's come on the other side of zero, right? It's to the left of zero. This is greater than 50%. I'd say it's like 55% would be my guess. But we wanna figure out what that actual p-value is. So that's step 11. We've got a p-value, okay? A p-value is a probability. So you owe me capital P with some stuff in parentheses. All right, now how, this is how this works. It's always a letter, a symbol, and then a number. So I'll write it here. Letter, number, oh my gosh. Letter, symbol, number. Okay, so here's how we're gonna piece this together. The letter you use is the same letter that you use in step six and it's the same letter used in step nine. We're on the T distribution, okay? The symbol you use matches your alternate, and in this case, I had a greater than alternate. All right. If you have a left tail test, if you have a less than test, use the less than you, uh, uh, symbol right here. If you have a not equals to, it really depends. If this was not equals to, I get that it isn't, but let's say it was, because my test statistic was negative, I'd go left. If you had a not equals to and your test statistic was positive, you'd go right. So it really depends on the two-sided test. Okay, so we've got letter, symbol. Now the number is always the same number that you got from step 10, okay? So letter, symbol, number. All right, so with that, I'm gonna hop over to my calculator because we're gonna pick up a new part of our calculator. We're gonna see how to calculate this um, p-value using TCDF. All right, I'll catch you in a bit, bye. 
Hey guys, I want to show you how to use TCDF on your calculator. It is a lot like normal CDF. Uh, there is some differences, so let's go into it. So here I want to show you, we were just leaving off on the step where I we said our test statistic was negative 0.07. And let's not forget we had a right-tailed alternate. Okay, so we have a greater than alternate. So when we have a greater than alternate, we're going to want to make that graph, right? There's our T distribution, zeros under the peak, and we're just to the left of it, right? So you can see I'm trying to mark up my x-axis here with negative 0.07, and I want to shade to the right. I want the area under that curve. And when you're thinking about the area under that curve, you can see it's a pretty good chunk, right? This is the first time that we are shading some area under that curve together, and it's a little bit more than 50% because I'm a little bit to the left of zero. So how this works is you go to the same spot that you found normal CDF in, but we're gonna go a little further down. There should be a calculator option called TCDF. Now, depending on whether you have a TI-83 or 84, it might be in um, menu item six, like it is in this calculator, or it could be menu five, I think, for the TI-83s. I can't quite remember where it is for the TI-83s, but we all have it. So let's go down to TCDF, okay. All right, so in TCDF, you need three things, all right? Normal CDF, you need a low, high, mean, standard deviation. TCDF, you need low, high, and then you need the degrees of freedom. So TCDF, it's a little simpler. Low, high, degrees of freedom. So my low was negative 0.07. My high was 1E99. And if you remember, we had 10 employees for this sample, so I had nine degrees of freedom. If I close that parentheses and hit enter, there's my p-value. It's about 53%, right? And you can see here, I, I went um, a little bit further, I went negative 0.0669, that's why you can see there's a slight um, decimal discrepancy between the key and what you're seeing on my calculator. Both answers are correct, it's about 53%. So that's your first look at how you can use TCDF. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye. Okay, I'm back. So this is gonna be, as we just discussed, this is TCDF. You're gonna go low, high, degrees of freedom. So negative 0 0.07, 1099, and I had nine degrees of freedom. And let's just review that up on my calculator here. So I'm gonna hit second bars, go to TCDF, and then I'm going to do low, high, and we had, what, nine degrees of freedom. So when I crunch this number, I'm looking at about 53%. Okay. All right, so we're through 13 steps, not 13, I can count. We're through 12 steps here. We have step 13 left to do. So I actually need to make my conclusion known here. So let me get all of this out of the way and let's see if we can take care of step 13 here. All right, so for step 13, we actually need to commit, right? What are we gonna do? Are we gonna reject the null or fail to reject the null? And then do we have evidence for the alternate or not? All right, so let's find out, okay? So here's how we make our decision. It's all about whether or not your p-value is less than or greater than alpha. So this is step 11 in comparison to step four. All right, so our p-value this time out, we had 53% here and we had 5% here, okay? So which direction did this go? Well, 53% is greater than alpha, right? So our p-value was greater than alpha, so we will fail to reject the null. That's my first sentence. I'll say because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject H0. So let me write that up, okay? So because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject H0. Okay. And this is where you have to be really subtle. And, and, and make sure you're paying attention to detail. You're failing to reject H0. So we're not saying, yes, we've proven that H0 is true. We assumed it to be true anyways. 
What we're trying to say is you just have not convinced me that mu is greater than 75. So you have not proven the alternate. All right, this is not the same as saying we proved HO, right? We, we got to assume the null was true right out the gate. This is saying we have not proven H sub A. Oops, I moved that around. Let me get that back up and straight. So once you fail to reject H naught, you would say you do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate, right? You have not proven the alternate. Now, I'm not gonna write the word alternate. I'm gonna use it in context. So when you fail to reject H naught, your second sentence should say, we do not have sufficient evidence And I'm gonna put right here for HA, and then we're gonna erase it. All right, so yes, we do not have significant evidence or sufficient evidence for the alternate, but don't write H sub A. Tell me what the, the alternate actually represents. So we do not have evidence that mu is greater than 75. Well, what was mu? The true average daily personal use of company technology is greater than 75 minutes. So instead of we do not have sufficient evidence for al the alternate, I'm gonna say we do not have su sufficient evidence that the true average daily personal use of company technology is greater than 75 minutes. All right, so you have not convinced me that the CEO's employees are spending more than 75 minutes on personal use of company tech. Right? You have not proven the alternate to me. I'm gonna fail to reject the null, okay? All right, so with that, Let's start to consider what types of errors we might have made and whether or not these results are statistically significant. So it's been a little while since we looked at errors. If you remember, you can make two types of errors. You can make a type one error and a type two error. And it all depends on what you did with the null. Did you reject it or fail to reject it? So if we look at our options for our errors, this was back um, after example four, we talked about this. So a type one error is when you reject the null and it was true, okay? A type two error is failing to reject the null when it was false. So in terms of which error might we have made, we gotta decide, did we reject H naught or did we fail to reject H naught? And if we look at our write-up, we failed to reject H naught. Well, when you fail to reject H naught, you can potentially make a type two error. All right, because if you fail to reject H naught, meaning you kept it, but the alternate was really true, if the second equation was really true, you made a type two error. So potentially, all right, every time you fail to reject the null, you have potentially made a type two error. All right, if you, rejected the null, I, I get that we didn't in this example, but if you had rejected the null, you might have potentially made a type one error, okay? Now, it says, are these test results statistically significant? All right, well, we said statisticians say test results are statistically significant if the null is rejected. That's the cutoff, so let's look. Did we reject the null? Nope, we failed to reject it. So are these test results statistically significant? No. We're not gonna change our mind about this CEO's employees. We think they're spending about 75 minutes a day on personal use of company tech, and that's the average um, along, uh, among all workers, right? That's what the Associated Press was reporting. So the CEO's employees aren't spending more time on average than the average worker out there. All right, so with that, I'm gonna flip over to my calculator and I'm gonna show you how your calculator can help you with steps 10, 11, and 12 specifically, and how I actually use my calculator right out the gate to help me with this write-up. So usually I'm running everything on my calculator and then using all of those output screens to help me with this 13-step proof. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye.
Hey guys, I'm back. Let's take a look at how you could use your calculator on this problem the whole way through. So again, it would get us steps 10, 11, and 12 right out the gate, and I wouldn't have to crunch too much on my calculator. So we're going to go into stats. Well, make sure your data is in your list first of all. So let's hit stat, go to tests. Now we're in mean land, so we're going to ignore options 5 and 6. They have the word proportion in there. So we, we're not in prop land, we're going means. That gets us down to options one through four. The first two are when you have one sample. Options three and four are when you have two samples. We only had one random sample of these 10 employees. Yes, the sample size was 10, but I only did this once, or at least this, this experiment, this survey was only run once. Now, you can run uh, in Meanland, you have the option of a Z or a T test. We don't have any information about our population standard deviation, so I'm going to go with the t-test. And just in general, when you have a pretty small sample size, like 10, you're going to run the t-test. It's going to have a little bit larger of a p-value, a little bit more variability, just to kind of cover our bases because we have such a small sample size. All right, so here you get the options. Do you have raw data or do you have summary statistics? And for us, we actually had raw data this time. My stuff is in L1. So go ahead and make sure data is highlighted, not stats. Um, let's go look at our mu sub zero. That's asking, what was your null hypothesis? And our null mean, I should say, was 75 minutes. Ooh, not sure what I hit. Let me go hit stat tests two. Get back to this screen. So I had 75 minutes, okay. My data was in L1. I put every data value in exactly once. So I wanna keep that frequency at one. In terms of these menu options, decide do you have a two-tailed test, a left-tailed test, or a right-tailed test. And if I go back to my work, I can see I had a right-tailed test, a greater than, so I'm going to pick this third option, which just happens to be highlighted already on my calculator. And then you can either opt for calculate or draw. I usually start with calculate because it'll give me steps 10 and 11, and then I move over to draw because it'll give me step 12. So if I head over here and I hit calculate, there's my test statistic, there's step 10, there's my p-value, there's step 11, and the thing that I like about this calculator screen is the next three lines are all that I really need from one variable stats to, to do my write-up. So where before we were doing one bar stats and reading the mean and reading the standard deviation, it's kind of cool. Like you just run a t-test and that calculator output screen is everything you're going to need for your 13 steps. So you don't actually need to go and run one of our stats. You just need to know where to look on your calculator or your technology's output screen. So I've got all of that, right? There's the 74.8, the 9.45. You saw me putting that here in my write-up, right? Here's the 74.8 and again the 94.5, excuse me, 9.45 coming in on my write-up. So I use all of that information in my write-up. Let's run this again, and I want to show you how I can get this, this graph. So let's go to the draw option. So stat test two. Let's go down here, hit draw. Okay. And then you're going to see this T distribution, the T distribution with nine degrees of freedom, right? And there's how much I shaded. It's a pretty good chunk right there because I have a right tail and it's a pretty large right tail because my test statistic is actually negative, right? And this is part of why we were going to fail to reject the null. It, it actually looks like her employees might spend less time um, than 75 minutes, or they might actually spend 75 minutes, um, and just by random chance, their sample mean was 74.8. But this is definitely not evidence that they're spending more than 75 minutes a day um, on personal use of company technology. So again, we're going to fail to reject that null, but I think, or I hope you're starting to see that this calculator output screen here and this draw command here can basically take you through all of your 13 steps if you know what to look for. All right, so that's our second look at a hypothesis test on our calculator. First one in mean land, uh, the first one we did in mean land. The first one we did was in proportion land, but this one's in mean land. All right, so with that, um, I'm going to call, call it a day on this problem. I'll see you in a bit. Bye.